Fasten your seatbelts. The foremost authority on 9-11. The best-selling author of Methodical Illusion. And a researcher extraordinaire. Rebecca Roth is about to step up to the microphone and launch into Reality Check, where the light will shine brightly upon the truth. Live from Winnemucca, Nevada, it's the Rebecca Roth Show starring Rebecca Roth. And I'm your host, Ramjet. Have you won any muckas? <laughs> How do you win a mucka? <laughs> and what is a mucka? I don't think anybody knows. <laughs> well, that's a fun name but to say. But they do have internet here. Oh, <laughs> well, that's a good thing. It's always good that you can land yourself somewhere where you have internet. That's always a good thing, especially on Saturdays. Well, welcome. Not, not, not the case in Battle Mountain. <laughs> you tried that, huh? It okay. can work. <laughs> that's okay. why the show's late. All right. Well, welcome to the Rebecca Roth Show. I'm so glad that it all is coming together for you uh, through the miracle of electronics. That's just amazing. Well, so Battle Mountain's not so good, huh? Okay, well, I guess I won't go there unless I want to be off the grid. Okay. Oh, um, that's off the grid. Trust me. <laughs> that's off the grid. Exactly. You could be the mayor of Battle Mountain and they wouldn't know where you were. <laughs> Sounds like it. Hey, well, okay, first off, I want to uh, touch on something because a lot of people are experiencing this. And I want you to just think about this for a second. I have written three, soon to be four, novels. They are using a terabyte of Freedom of Informa Information Act data, a team of aviation experts, my 30-year career with the airline, as an international purser and a flight attendant, and a lot of imagination, but the 9-11 stuff is, is based on a lot of people's research, including you know, a terabyte of FOIA data. And not just that, but there's a lot more. Now, why do you suppose Google is so intimidated by three novels? Not just Google. There's a few internet trolls out there that have made claims that I'm all these other people and that I never flew. And why is it my airline career is such a threat to those online trolls? And why is it that Google has decided that my membership site... For those of you who want to come in and go a little bit deeper and have direct communication with the author, me, um, why is it, do you think, that Google has put this big red wall up that says it's a phishing site? Now, just so you know, it's been turned in by many people as a false um, accusation, let's call it that way, because I actually am working on a lawsuit right now against them. So it is not a phishing site. And just so you know, if you come in and you want to become a member, there's still a 30% discount for you. But all of your financial information is run through PayPal. So I've even asked Google if they've got some kind of hard on against uh, PayPal that they're making this accusation that I'm going to steal your financial information. I don't have any access to any information. PayPal has it all. And probably if you look deep enough, Google does too. But I don't. So their accusation of me stealing your financial data is wrong, and it's a character assassination. But let me ask you this again. Why is it that three novels about 9-11, written by a career airline professional with the help of numerous aviation experts, a terabyte of Freedom of Information Act data, and more, is such a threat to Google? Hmm, who do you think Google is? Why are three novels, soon to be four, such a threat that they're claiming that the membership site where you can go and you can find information that I'm not putting out publicly on Google? I did that. Remember, about a year ago, we put a show together, which I believe is still on the Vimeo channel. Uh, we put a show together where I did a screen a sh a capture and showed you what the files look like. I'm going to do another one of those maybe next week. Now, when that happened without email, without warning, without any of this stuff, Alex Jones claims he, that he gets all these threats, nothing. My entire two and a half years of YouTube presentations, which are now over on Spreaker, dot com slash Rebecca Roth show 
and also uh, a lot of it's over on Vimeo. But they just completely nuked any race two and a half years on the, sh the f show <laughs> that I showed you the radar and text and other files from the Freedom of Information Act data that we used to find the truth about 9-11. Now, I can't show you all of our experience, but some of that has been written into the novels. It's not just my experience, it's other flight attendants' experience, it's other crew members' experience, it's people that flew for American and United and U.S. Air and other major carriers on 9-11, before and after 9-11. Uh, it's people that were in the intelligence community, the drug enforcement people. It's people from the FBI, the CIA that are no longer there that saw things. These are people that were U.S. Sky Marshals. There's a gazillion people that have come forward since my first book and the interview on Coast to Coast AM like four years ago maybe now. I I'm assuming it's... Uh, I think it was, I came out in November of 2014. So I think in March of 2015, I did the interview with Coast to Coast AM. Since then, there's three more books, soon to be the third one, soon is coming out. So why do you suppose this is such a threat to have these novels out there that a, a, a company as large and all encompassing as Google would attack me personally for the website where you can come in and you can communicate with me directly. I can show you data. We can talk about stuff. There's interviews there. There's uh, videos there that you can't hear the information anywhere but the membership site. Why do you think they want to shut that down? I know the answer to this. Let's hear it. Because you're telling the truth. And the last thing they want as a quasi-government entity or somebody who works within the uh, auspices of the FBI, the CIA. So what the last thing they want is the truth about 9-11 exposed in any way, shape or form. If it's in a public form like this radio show that you can listen to every week, they can take it down. But when you do things behind the galley curtain, they, they have a much harder way of monitoring that. And so the way they do it is take the whole they just take there. the whole thing down. Now, you need to be clear. The you can get into behind the galley curtain use any using any browser except Chrome. Chrome is owned by Google and Google is the one that's doing this. So you can't register, you can't uh, get in on a on a daily basis to hear the daily news show if you use Chrome. You can get in. Here's what you have to do if you're only using a Chrome browser or if you're using anybody else that decides to do this. So far it's only Chrome. But you want to go click on details and or go to site anyway, because there's nothing, I mean, there's so much um, malware protection and the like on that site. And the phishing part where they say that I'm stealing your financial data, that data goes to uh, PayPal. <laughs> it's a lot bigger company than I am. So it's very threatening to see that some, this woman's going to steal your data. No, I'm not. I don't have access to it. So listen, when you do sign up and it's all this information there, how to get your 30% discount and all that stuff. If you want to continue the payment, if you can afford four to $6 a month, click the check the box to have it recurring. If you do that, then you need to take care of that as well. I'd, I can't even go in and uncheck that box for you in the back room. I don't have any access to any financial stuff, even continuing your um, membership. If, if that's, I, I just don't have any access. And those of you who have already decided for whatever reason you have to uh, drop out, I, I can't do it. So, so you know that this is a lie what they're doing. Um, Anyway, so you just want to click on details and go to site anyway. And then there's a box in your privacy to check. And it's called a whitelist and just whitelist the site. Or please do not do Google searches on Google and don't use Chrome as your browser. And you won't have any problem. Now, I'm here to tell you for a fact that, Chrome, that Google does not want the truth to come out to the point where they're intimidated by three soon to be four novels. Come on, seriously. Okay, in my online bookstore, 
You can click to and all of the links that you can find me. And if you're listening to this on YouTube, I highly suggest you move over to the Vimeo channel and you'll find a link to it down in the description box um, uh, that you go there because every day I expect Google, who owns YouTube, to nuke the YouTube channel because they don't want you to know the truth. And I know it all. Well, I mean... The, this whole thing with Google is really annoying. However, it's a sense of validity in the in the fact that obviously you're telling the truth or they wouldn't care about you. I mean, you are pretty insignificant in terms of what things are, except for the truth. That's the only thing that they care about and they don't want that exposed uh, under any conditions, <laughs> no matter how small of audience you might have. Well, it's a, it's very interesting to me. This uh, and I've uh, by the way, I have worked me into the next novel. So those of you who think you know who I am, <laughs> there'll be more entertainment in there. So you, if you're really curious about um, my life, I'm not writing about myself, but there's a character in there that's me. So. Uh, if you're into that sort of thing. Is it Max can... Hager? <laughs> no. Um, but you can kind of go in there and kind of figure out who is she really? I'm a really old lady with gray hair sitting in a rocking chair, right? Oh, oh one of, you know, right now it's really weird because what's what this has done to me since I've been attacked by online trolls and Google. <laughs> so I've got the government attacking me. Remember also right after I did the show where I showed you the meta tags that were up, the, where the radar and stuff was uploaded before 9-11, I'd gone in and I showed you all that stuff on that uh, video. Well, that's such a, that was such an intimidation that my website, my membership website went into, according to the people that do the hosting for the website, a state-sponsored malware attack where they had to put up all their screens. I put up extra uh, screens. Uh, they shut the site down three times. Nobody could get in. I couldn't get in to, to do anything. Um, the people that host the site were telling me this is a state-sponsored brute force malware attack. Why? Because they've never, they had never seen any website like this. This is a book author membership site. Well, he's like, guys, who's, who, who hates you? I said, the government. And why is that? Oh, because I wrote three novels that they don't want the information to come out with. So I guess I'm val validified. <laughs> I feel va very, very uh, valid. Well, the problem is, is you're not just espousing crazy nonsense conspiracy theories or stuff that you just thought up on your own. In almost every single case that where you're exposing things that are the truth, they have been uh, given to you or reconfirmed by people in various industries who have said, this is what I saw, this is what I did, this is what I know. And it's not just your uh, opinions about things, like so many other truthers out there that it just, you know, spout whatever it is that comes to their head. You actually have stuff, and that's why it's threatening, because it is truthful information from places that the government doesn't want the public to know about. Exactly. Okay, here's a, an update for you. I know that <laughs> this whole thing is so crazy. Um, I never really thought my retirement would end up... I never wanted to be a writer or an author. I never thought I'd have a Pulitzer Prize under my belt. Never you wanted never one. wanted to retire. <laughs> No, I mean, I, I, I enjoy life, but I never thought it would, my retirement would be filled with drones and uh, the uh, insanity that, that writing about 9-11 has brought into my life and others that think that the people think I am. Okay, book four. I have set a release date for September 1st. It may come out somewhere between August 20th and the 1st of September. But uh, that book will come out, and within the next probably three or four weeks, a website will be up. So you then we'll talk about the title, and then um, we'll figure out if you want to pre-order and that sort of thing. Remember that if you're a member at Behind the Galley Curtain, you're going to get 15% discount on all the books and the FOIA data, whatever that's in that little store that we have. So anyway, then I'm going to try to put together a... A four books, 
price. Like right now, uh, the sale there's a sale on the softbacks. All three books are thirty nine dollars US. Uh, and then if you're international, you can still get those, but we have to add shipping and you'll have to do that through the publisher and all that information's in the online bookstore. So you can go to any one of the websites and I go there and you can get that, um, publisher at ktysmedia.com, I think is the email. So you can find out how much shipping would be to your country and you get autographed books and they come with, you know, vinyl window stickers so you can help promote the truth and the books and um, laminated uh, bookmarks and stuff like that. So there's extras there. And um, I'm going to try to put together like we have right now, a three book series and then a four book series when this one comes out also. So it'll be available in the bookstore because if you go to Amazon, you're going to have to pay, you know, for each book. And th so then I'm trying to help you out here um, and make it so it's, you know, more affordable. $39 for, uh, let's see, twenty, forty, sixty dollars worth of books is a good deal, and if you're in the U.S., it's free shipping. So, anyway, that's kind of what's going on with that. And then, well, I know you haven't talked to the publisher about this, but maybe what you'll even do is put a book one and book two together at a special price, and book three and book four together at a special price, and then all oh, that's four a good books, idea. And then all four books together at a. Uh, I better special write that price. down so I don't forget because I am a retiree. <laughs> Okay, so that is a good idea, actually, because, you know, it's, I'm all for making, uh, helping people out financially, and I've given away a lot of books from people that are just in a crisis right now, but are dying to read the books. So, uh, yes, yeah, so we'll try to do that. And that's a great idea, book one and two, and then three and four, and then all four of them together at a special price. Okay, so for those of you who are wondering, what's next? What do you do when Google attacks you <laughs> and you're being attacked by little online trolls? Um, well, here's the, what I'm going to do, Google. Here's what I'm going to do. So you can prepare yourself for this. My next project, I've already kind of got it outlined and started in that format, is a nonfiction book. Yes, a nonfiction book. So in that... So if you don't have a mad enough at you already in putting the truth out in novel form, yeah, this one... you're going to put it out in a nonfiction where they can, they can really be PO'd at you. Yeah, exactly. This one's going to take them down. Okay, so what I'm going to do is using their own data is put together this nonfiction book. And it may end up being more than one, but a lot of people, you know, a lot of men out there, they, they just don't want to read a fiction book because they're, you know, they're too intelligent for that I guess I don't know I you know there's a reason for putting things out in uh, that format of a novel and since really that reason is no longer there because I've had drones after me I've had to uh, pack up and move and be mobile and go places like Battle Mountain <laughs> where, where there is no internet and uh, just so I are can't... you running for mayor <laughs> I can't be found. I don't carry a cell phone. I don't have any location on any devices. I use several proxy servers. Uh, and I have uh, some of those IP addresses are people that I know and care about. Um, but they're not me. So, you know, I've learned a lot. Uh, and mainly because I really thought that, well, I thought that from the very get-go. I was first attacked by internet trolls that aren't very bright. Uh, then secondly, I was in, attacked by the United States government, and they are bright. So I was prepared for the United States government um, in using and learning how to do different things in, as far as internet security, uh, proxy servers, making myself look like I'm somewhere else. And I'm always at least two states away from from the IP address that I, I'm pinging out of. So um, I just, I know I did that, and I guess I'm glad I did now, but... Um, I needed to stay alive to get this information out. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to, uh, a lot of people I know, sometimes they email me and they're like, uh, am, am I Vera Hansen? No, I'm not. Uh, Vera Hansen is a combination of a whole bunch of flight attendants that I knew and flew with. I never lived in Seattle. I just went there and I loved the city. And I actually went to uh, some restaurants in the area where she ends up living in the books. Uh, and I just thought it was just the, the most quaint place. Now, this was years ago. I have no idea what that place is like now. 
because uh, I don't live there and I don't visit there. I don't fly. So um, I'm on the ground in ground transportation only. That's how I live now. Are you sure you aren't very handsome? I'm not very handsome. Do you, I have, a, do you have a coat that says <laughs> I really don't care to you? No, but I'd like to buy that coat. Um yeah, I thought that was kind of cool. I would like to have that coat. I saw that uh, there's some on eBay. I might buy one this afternoon. Okay, so one of the things that in this nonfiction series, maybe, let's call it a nonfiction series. I have a feeling there's going to be <laughs> more than one nonfiction coming out. And it's not your fault because the government keeps changing the story. Exactly. Well, here's one of the things that I've really discovered in and this and and that's why some people that came out right away uh in 9/11 and I think what inspired them was Dr. Stephen Jones quite frankly because he was in it, he is I shouldn't say was he is <laughs> I know he's he's read some of my books I'm not sure if he's gotten through the whole series but he is an a brilliant scientist. And what did Dr. Stephen Jones find? He found nanothermite. And nanothermite being a form of explosives that were in the dust of the World Trade Center towers, not just thermite, which is very common in a controlled demolition. But nanothermite takes thermite a step further, but it's not available to anyone on the street, even if you have a demolition company. And I actually worked for somebody that had a demolition company. So, you know, when you live long enough, I mean, you have a lot of experiences. So, um, but nanothermite is only available uh, to the United States government. And I believe the government of Israel also is involved in the production of nanothermite. Now, if you're uh, aware of somebody that claims that nanothermite wasn't there, you need to read Dr. Stephen Jones' peer-reviewed paper about it because she gets a little bit triggered when she hears nanothermite. Now, who do you think she's working for? The United States government or the government of Israel or both? Because that's what she's hiding. Now, I'm all about finding out all the truth Okay, so if nanothermite is there, it is there. And what does that tell us? That the government of Israel and or the United States were involved in putting it there somehow. Whether they rented a room and a suite or a floor or had other type of agents planning it. But it's there and you can't say it isn't or you're protecting some government entity enough of that. That's just nonsense. So the, the important thing now to me is that you, as the reader, if you've made it through all four books, and let me just say this because I know a lot of people are waiting for this fourth book. Why am I waiting for this? I had to do a little rework from information that came in um, because I didn't want to keep continue writing novels because I've kind of been uh, pressuring myself to get this nonfiction put together. So, but I thought this information was important in the novel series. So it's going to be there. And I had to do a little rework uh, action. And then I had to wait in line for my editor to uh, get her time free. And that, that comes the 1st of August. So, and I have a pretty good idea how long all of that takes. The website, the cover art, all that stuff's all done. I just, it just all needs to be launched and it'll all happen here in the next probably 30 days. So uh, you'll get to see the website. I'm not quite sure if I'm going to put any of the book on that website. Probably not, but you never know. Um, it's interesting. You know, I did for uh, the first book, I put the first three chapters on and I, I literally had a half a dozen people contact me about uh, errors that were made. Now, when you copy and paste something into a website, it's not always uh, what you copy and paste. There's stuff that happens and in the translation. So if there, you know, there's a period that's not supposed to be there or that's missing or some other, you know, and I really literally had grammar police contacting me and ripping into me that I couldn't write because I didn't put a period at the end of the sentence. Well, it's all in copying, pasting and stuff. And so I just took it out. Screw you people. <laughs> screw you people that are the uh, grammar police and your emails have been blocked as well and so you know 
<laughs> That's kind of what I do. I mean, listen, if you miss the entire thing because you're caught up on a quotation mark or a period, either being there or not being there on a website, I don't, I can't help you. <laughs> you're beyond help. <laughs> so, uh, and quite frankly, I don't care. And so that's why I want the, I want her jacket. I want the first lady's jacket. Um, but here's the interesting thing that, that also that I want to talk about. You know, if I get one of those jackets, then I can wear them with the Winnemuccas that I'm going to win. <laughs> yeah. Where is that place anyway? I've never heard of it. Winnemucca? Yeah. Oh, it's, it's right in the great... middle, right in the middle of the state. Of Nevada? Yeah. On Nevada, <laughs> right, right across I-80 I heading. Must be hot whichever there. Whichever direction you're heading. Uh-huh. Oh, it's always hot. Okay. It's well, even cold in the it's winter. It's a desert, eh? Yeah. It's, mm. You know, basically, Nevada is an armpit. <laughs> so you keep going there. Hey, you know, today Donald Trump is at, uh, in Nevada, but the southern end, I think. Yeah, I think he's Vegas. in Las Vegas. Okay. So um, also what I want to kind of chit-chat just a little bit about 9-11 stuff, because I know we tried to talk about that a little bit. We're about halfway through the show. One of the things that I've really, um, I, at first I had trouble with this at, at, at when I first found the hijackers still alive um, and who they worked for and stuff like that. Um, I found there was a lot of disinformation, like that lady that keeps denying that nanothermite was in the dust when in fact it really was. Who are you going to believe? Some lady that looks like she should be in the garden of an insane asylum or Dr. Stephen Jones? from the BYU, <laughs> pretty straight-laced there. And then also he worked for the Department of Energy. I can't remember where he's at now, um, but I have had some contact with him. So who are you going to believe? I mean, really, seriously, it's there. You can see it. It's there. It's under a microscope. It's there. It's There's no denying nanothermite was used. But then how does that work with the four airplane story? Well, what I found is that there were people from the very get-go, and this kind of, like I said, uh, when uh, Dr. Jones brought out uh, the peer-reviewed paper, and I referenced that to a character in Methodical Illusion, book number one, um, that nanothermite was found, it's a game changer because there is no nanothermite in an airplane. Hmm. Probably is no nanothermite found in an office for, you know, Marshall McClellan or, um, you know, Washington Group or, you know, even the FBI office probably doesn't have a lot of nanothermite hanging around. What about in Windows of the World up there at the restaurant? Is there probably, nanothermite yeah. in any of the refrigerators there? Probably not. Probably not. So what does that tell us? Well, it's kind of like when you go through and you look at all the different 302s. And this is one of the thing that things that... I'm going to have in the nonfiction, the textbook for those men out there that can't read about a flight attendant going to Tokyo. Or I mean, most women love this. Why don't you explain what a 302 is well, the for those of us who don't know? Okay. The FBI, when uh, obviously they started an investigation the morning of 9-11. And uh, they started doing what's called interviews. And the interview notes the transcription of those notes are usually typed out into a form called a 302. That, and now you're going to hear about this if you're paying attention to what's going on with uh, General Michael Flynn, uh, the Mueller investigation, and the Department of Justice FBI corruption that you're seeing in the House uh, Judiciary Committee and the Oversight Committee and the Senate um, I guess it's a Judiciary Committee from the Senate as well. So when we're talking about people like Peter Strzok, Lisa Page, that were having this uh, Trump derangement syndrome attack on text messages on their FBI phones. So one of the things they talked about when they're finding out now, as they've been in these hearings, is that somebody named Peter Strzok changed the 302s. Well, it's illegal to do that. You can write a new one, and change the story. And with FB, uh, the FBI in 9-11, here's what we know, FBI, CIA, and Google. We know for a fact, and this is one of the things that happened to me that I kind of got the red flag because they did it to Betty Ong's information. And this is when I saw, oh my God, they removed this. And I have found numerous 302s 
of the entire story, not just Betty Ong's four minutes of tape recorded story, which also changed. It's either, it's on a tape recording. It is or it isn't there. But the 302s are different, and there's many of them for her story. And in her story, one of the things they removed was her saying he stood upstairs. She only referred to a hijacker as one he. He had pepper spray or mace or something. He is coming back from business. Okay, the, the, all the stuff that she said, we're the first. A lot of this stuff was changed or completely deleted. And that's when I, the red flag went up for me when I'm reading FBI documentation that's different from a supposed tape recording. Well, one of the other things you were telling me the other day that you found <clears throat> is that the reservation agent that she called kept putting words in her mouth. If, you, if she was in a court of law, you would say, objection, your honor, leading the witness, because that's really <laughs> what she was doing. <clears throat> and I think I've always known that, that she was doing that, but I didn't know why. And you found out why. I did. And I'm going to let I'm going to let you in on it. If you've made it this far, you need to know this, that the ticket agent or the reservation agent at American Airlines that Betty Ong was talking to had a less than a, about a year or so, give or take a month or two, seniority as a reservation agent with American Airlines. And before that, she lived in Japan for 12 years and was an employee of the Department of Defense. Uh-oh. What does that tell you? Now we know why she was putting words in Betty Ong's mouth. Betty Ong never said there were three, four, or five hijackers or terrorists on the plane. She never said that. But this agent that she's talking to keeps filling in. Uh, and, and actually, let me just say this. I had an American Airlines flight attendant contact me questioning this agent, how did this agent know to say this? Because Betty never told her this. Well, keep in mind that Betty Young wasn't in three right on her cell phone and or her um, air phone talking to this agent. She was parked at a hangar at Westover, e either on the plane or probably more likely inside the room calling the number and getting connected to an agent that she knew who she was going to talk to, or at least the handlers knew exactly who it was she was going to talk to. What are the chances that Betty Ong would call out to a reservations office? First off, no flight attendant would do that. Second off, that she would connect with a DOD employee, the Department of Defense, for those of you who aren't into the acronyms, which is the Pentagon. What are the chances of that? Now, okay, for the flight attendants that have contacted me, now you know. And, you know, I, I just never spend a moment it, with I, where I'm not reading or researching or writing or I'm in the editing process of this uh, fourth book now before it goes to the real editor. <laughs> I like to go through and try to catch as much stuff as I can. And... Um, so there, I mean, I just, I'm a, kind of like Donald Trump. I, I'm up about 20, 21 hours a day. And this is, this is what's important to me is that all of the truth gets uncovered. And there are so many documents. And as time goes, it's the FBI producing more 302s and changing the story. So what you got to do is look at these things. I, I showed you Ramjet the other day, what I do when I find a 302 for some person, and then I find uh, another one or two or three or four more, you have to go through with colored highlighters to see what they've removed. And that's the key factor. And in this case with Betty Ong, what was removed is one very vital thing. Besides my own personal experience saying that if they put pepper spray or mace or mace or something in a pressurized cabin, the entire airplane, including the flight attendant, Betty Ong, seated 159 feet away from the cockpit, including the pilots, including the hijackers, and nobody told us that the hijackers were wearing gas masks, were they? So if you spray mace, pepper spray, or any other irritant in a pressurized cabin, everybody gets it. 
And the fact that Betty Ong was on the phone for 27 minutes to reservations and never coughed, never complained about her eyes watering, never choked up, and nor did Amy Sweeney, the other flight attendant. That told me this, that airplane was not in the air and was not pressurized. And the fact that two flight attendants didn't know where each other were or that each other were giving details told me they were in two different office rooms on two different landlines, not on cell phones. But I think more importantly, the fact that you have eyewitnesses who have seen those planes land at Westover or right on final approach to landing at Westover really solidifies the fact that those people were who were calling those numbers and that have rec- either been recorded or have 302s from the FBI whose primary responsibility was to cover this all up, uh, they know that it's that's just not the truth and that those planes were indeed on the ground. I even have an eyewitness that was an ex-FBI special agent that happened to witness two of the planes landing. (laughs) Now, what we've learned from the uh, judiciary hearings of late is there are people in the FBI who are the good guys, the people who do their (laughs) job, and then there are people who are on the seventh floor and other places in FBI headquarters whose job it is to obfuscate absolutely everything and tell goofy stories about things, change 302s, and just make sure the truth is never divulged, ever, ever, so that if anybody gets close to it, they get confused. And I think, Rebecca, for you, one of the things that is important is you seem to never get confused. <laughs> well, um, I have a mind like a trap door, I guess, sometimes for some things. German I don't know. Shepherd. <laughs> I do forget some things occasionally, but uh, this happens to be my passion. So um, the thing that I experienced personally as a researcher or somebody, I mean, I have a science background. So uh, I mean, if you can follow molecules doing organic chemistry, you can do just about anything. And that's one of the things I think that helped me uncover all of this stuff. So not just me, but the other people that came to help and, and there's so many of them, and I wish I could name them all. Um, the uh, dedication in my fourth book, I'll, I'll name, name one because he just passed away, but, uh, and so he's safe from them now. Uh, <clears throat> but until then, I just, I, I, you know, I just can't say who they are, who anybody is. I have to keep everybody safe and myself safe. So, um, and I know, I, I mean, I'm the walking, talking proof of how evil evil is because the, they really want to silence me for writing novels. It's very telling, isn't it? But one of the things that I, I had to do is weed through a lot of what's in, what's called disinformation. And, you know, even, even for myself, I have had a lot of trolls call me a shill for the government. Well, obviously they haven't read the books or listened to any of my shows. Um, and also uh, one character thought I was... Um, a CIA agent. Now, I've always been a flight attendant, so that's not true. Uh, and why would I expose the deep state as a participant in uh, both the planning, perpetration, and the cover-up of 9-11? Uh, why would I expose that there were no Arabs on board, but there were somebody else that did this? Why would I expose the involvement of the crew? Why would I expose all the things that I have if I was working for the government? That's just somebody who hasn't read, who just sits there on their keyboard discrediting or trying to discredit anybody that maybe has a bigger audience in them. And there's a lot of that on the internet. There's a lot of disinformation that came out. We call them no planers. And in a sense, they were correct because the planes did not hit the targets. This we know, there was no airplane that flew into the Pentagon. Now, how do I know that personally? Well, I know that personally for many, many reasons. One, I can tell you that there is high definition video of a missile striking. Those of you at Google, you know that, don't you? Okay, and the CIA, you know it too. And the DOD, yeah, you know it too, don't you? And there are people that were shown these videos that have come forward. Okay, so we actually have talked to a gentleman who was involved with military intelligence, happened to be outside the building on the lawn, and no airplane 
flew over him. But he did experience the explosion. And so this is the same kind of stuff that happened in New York City, in Shanksville, and everybody wants to know, well, what happened to all of the bodies and the parts and the luggage and all the titanium engine parts and the landing gear and the wings and the tail section and all that stuff that always survives a airplane crash. And why isn't it everywhere at these four sites that day? And why did the black boxes all disappear for years? And then they found one and they were the wrong ones. It's all buried at Shanksville in the memorial. All of it. <laughs> all the plane parts, everything. It's the biggest memorial you've ever yeah. seen. And so one of, the, one of the things I'm seeing is that this amount of disinformation and craziness. Remember the flight attendants were kidnapped? Well, one of the reasons I... I wrote Methodical Illusions was so you see what we do when we get ready to go on a flight. How do we show up? Uh, there's videos in the membership uh, site also of what happens when, how do we bid? How do we know what flights we're working? We don't just randomly walk into an airplane and, and crew it. <laughs> but we're in communication with the company for hours before that happens. How is a reserve person notified? When do they get notification? How many of the crew members on 9-11 were last minute additions and why? And so what I saw was something that's referred to as a poison the fruit. And that's what disinformation is. That's why people can't tell you nanothermite was involved, but it was. Why are you trying to hide this fact? Why does my airline career really threaten people that have come out and made false accusations about hijackers, hijackings, and other events, and now have to flee the country? Why are they doing this stuff? Well, because these are the people that are actually out there for spreading what's called disinformation. And they can't, that's what they, that their whole job is to discredit the truth. And with 9-11, what happened is the same people that were involved in it were involved in the poisoning the fruit, in the disinformation part, spreading crazy voice morphing and all kinds of crazy conspiracy theories. Why? Because they feared that somebody with information and an inside knowledge of the airlines would all of a sudden wake up and say, wait a minute, this isn't what we would say or do in a hijacking. There's something wrong with this picture. And then like a rabid animal, <laughs> gather up every bit of real government data and stories from the media that were fed by the deep state and put it all together. And that's where the nonfiction books are gonna come. That's what, that's what you're gonna get to see. Well, there are certainly those uh organizations and government entities that are more than willing to discredit everything and cover up anything until make tells all kinds of lies but there are also innocent people and a lot of these people were family members of people who may or may not have been involved but they are innocent and you know their job is to essentially keep their family members dreams and hopes and and status alive and the government is continuing to feed these people information, which allows them to continue to go out and basically discredit or uh, put disinformation out that is just mind boggling. It is truly mind. I know I've shared a bunch with you over the last 48 hours. Um, one of the things that, uh, this, that the government overlooked, and I, I know I've worked this into the books already, is that cell phones technology in 2001, you could not make a cell phone call from altitude above much more than 15 to possibly 1800 feet, which is the first minute or two of a flight leaving a major city. And then you lost it because the technology was analog. It was a like a G2 system, analog system. Uh, and we ran off of cell phone towers. And if you can remember back then, if you're old enough to remember back then, um, that uh, you just didn't get a lot of good cell reception, even on the ground if you were in your car, because you went from cell phone tower to tower. It's a lot like tower. trying to get a signal in Battle Mountain. Yeah. <laughs> Ain't going to happen. There's still places like that. Okay. Now, I, so one of the people that's contacted me was with Verizon and explained that whole thing and reconfirmed the fact that... Um, 
cell phones did not work from altitude. Now, one of the things that the, they forgot and part of the reason for them forgetting is that government agents often fly on like Gulfstream 500s, they're really nice little private jets or government aircraft, military or government aircraft. And guess what technology they had in 2000 and 2001? They had the technology to make a phone call and to get on the internet. So we don't get that technology so after the, they've had it. So they were used to flying around, being able to make a phone call. And you couldn't because in 2001, you, there was no technology like that. And the air phones, by the way, American Airlines had removed all of theirs on their 757s. By January 31st, 2001, to eight months before 9-11. So Betty, or, um, Barbara Olson did not and could not have called out on an air phone, Ted. Ted, <laughs> Ted Olson, get, calling Ted Olson. <laughs> or a cell phone. Yeah, there was no way she could true. communicate with dear old Teddy from the air. And, not going to happen. And what's interesting, too, is because I've just come, kind of gathered a bunch of t uh, Ted Olson uh, lies and his crazy nonsense so-called story. And keep in mind, this happened on his birthday. And um, so why would you ask, would Barbara all of a sudden have to get up on a plane and leave on her, on her husband's birthday? But doesn't she have any say-so on her own personal schedule? Because somebody called her and told her, this is the day we're going to pull this off. Not just Barbara Olson, but a lot of other people that got this last-minute phone call. And some people don't even know who the call came from. But they were just told they got to get on these planes. And it ends up that they now all have scholarship funds and other money grab funds still going on 17 years later. But the overlook was the cell phone calls. And so it's interesting to see is that um, the FBI somehow, maybe that day, got contacted by someone, and it could have been Dina Burnett. She was a Delta flight attendant. Her husband, Tom, was on Flight 93, supposedly phoned her from his cell phone, and since she was a flight attendant on a leave of absence or had just recently retired, I don't remember which, but she has uh, two or three little kids at home. She looks at her caller ID and says it's Tom Sell, which told her as a flight attendant, he was not on an aircraft because cell phones didn't work. And so she picked up the phone and said, oh, well, Tom, what, what's going on? Are you okay? What's, you know, she just assumed he had a change of plans and that he maybe couldn't get on his flight. And uh, so he tells her that he's on uh, flight 93 and they've been hijacked right and so he calls her back up four or five times each time from his cell phone when the fbi shows up at her home you know they confiscate her uh, caller id and start arguing with her that he couldn't have called from a cell phone if if he was at, at altitude now not only that at that time they were at forty-two thousand feet <laughs> which is really impossible to make a phone call or even get a text message. And not many people were texting at that time, but um, it, none of it was possible with the technology that we had then. And this has been reconfirmed by uh, a, you know people that were in Verizon uh, phone system and were very familiar with how the system worked and that sort of thing to me, which I appreciate. I always appreciate reconfirmation. I know for a fact as a flight attendant, as an airline person, as somebody that flew around a lot, uh, that that technology, the phone calls were, were impossible to make. And so what what you see is the 302 story changing so that uh, over this last 17 years, the FBI has written so many different renditions of the 302s of their, uh, these are the original interviews with people that received a call uh, and family members and this sort of thing that they're like, they're scrambling to change the story. And they changed the story from the uh, 2000 and now here's the timeline. 2001, September 11th was the event. 2004, the 9-11 commission came out. I believe it was in June or July that summer of 2004. I think that's when the print, print version or it just started. And then in 2006, we had the 20th hijacker. Now, who is this guy? Boy, would I love to sit down and have some Turkish coffee or a cup of tea with Zachariah Moussaoui because he wasn't the 20th hijacker. But it's interesting that he actually connects 
to a couple CIA assets. How do you suppose he got the password for a CIA asset or a Mossad asset? I because some of these guys were not just CIA, they were Mossad military or uh, intelligence from Mossad, uh, Israel. How do you suppose he got the guy's laptop and password? Hmm, he must have been good, huh? But he wasn't so good that he didn't stay out of prison, because I think that's where he's supposed to be now. Whether he is or not is anybody's guess, but I'd sure love to go have a cup of tea with him, because he had nothing to do with 9-11, because here's the deal. The hijackers that they claim were on the planes are were not on the planes, and they cannot, they, the United States government, cannot produce one photograph of them getting on board one of those four aircraft that day. But there are photographs, and there is information of other people, and on the passenger manifests, there are no Arabs. Now, the FBI has cooked up some great stories and they even cooked up their original story and brought in three of the people they acclaimed had flown through the World Trade Center towers or the Pentagon or Shanksville were still alive. Well, you know, you want to have uh, a cup of tea with uh, Masawi. I would love to have a Zamzan Cola with colleague Sheikh Mohammed. <laughs> and maybe even give him a set of your books. Yeah. If they'll let him read and yeah, get that, well. that is just I don't amazing. know that he reads English. And we, yeah, I'm pretty sure you haven't translated him into Arabic yet. Yeah, that's true. And so you got to ask yourself, now that you know the truth, and you will know the entire truth when you finish the last chapter of book four, and I bet you finish it uh, somewhere there around Labor Day weekend. <laughs> The fr by September 11th, if you're, if you're a, a person on the ball, you will have your book for ordered and have it in your hot little hands by the first part of September. And by September 11th, because all of this crazy rigmarole, how they, they buried parts of Flight 93 airplane, baloney they did, because that airplane's still in the air. Okay, so all of the baloney that you're going to see about the 17th year anniversary of 9-11 and all the baloney about hijackers and Arabs and Muslims and all of that stuff, you're going to know who the real hijackers of 9-11 were. So help me, God, you're going to know it. And that last chapter will absolutely freaking blow your mind. And I, in fact, I've heard that your last <laughs> chapter of that book is so good that you didn't put it in the last chapter. You put it in the front because people are going to read it first. And so you just wanted to save them time. Yeah, really. I, I could just post the last chapter out on that website. Um, but you will know. And then let me just say this then. You're going to want to become a member at Behind the Galley Curtain. So you're going to want to not use Chrome as your browser and come in um, and we'll talk about it. And we'll do what's called jump seat therapy. And what jump seat therapy is, for those of you who are listening that don't fly, is that flight attendants, you know, we don't all know each other all the time. But I might fly with, let's just say, I'll say Jill. I might fly with Jill in January of uh, 2018 let's just say i'm still flying and i don't see her again until february of 2020. so i had sat down with her we had a long trip and when i saw her last in 2018 she had uh just given birth and she was on her first trip back and she was happily married to an airline pilot i run into her in february 2020 we're on a jump seat together a double jump seat and we're going to Tokyo. And I'm like, Jill, what's new? I haven't seen you for, what, two years. And so now she's got a two-year-old. She's going through a divorce because her husband had an affair with another flight attendant. And she starts bawling. And so she's got to get the story out. And so since I I'm a friend but not really a friend, we call that jump seat therapy. Okay, so sometimes it helps to have a sort of partial <laughs> friend but yet a stranger to go through your story with and everybody in those aisles has a story and some of the flight attendants have just buried their parents uh, some of them have just gone through are going through a horrific divorce some of them have children that have been stolen from them in their divorce or I, I mean it is truly an amazing thing and every time you see a flight attendant walking down the aisle she's got something going on somewhere and so her co-workers end up we do what's called jump seat therapy and help people get through so we can keep smiling so 
don't ever get off an airplane to see a flight attendant who's maybe been on duty 14 hours and say to her, smile, it can't be that bad. It's the least favorite thing of any flight attendant because everybody's got their world on the ground too that they're dealing with. And so uh, getting people through uh, with a little jump seat therapy, and you're going to need it after you finish reading all four books and the last chapter of book four because that's, that's your red pill. That's your exit out of the matrix, but it's really a difficult trip. So you're going to need that jump seat therapy. And so what we're going to do is uh, starting in September, um, <clears throat> the website will be uh, changed in our, our amount of time that I'm in the chat room and that I'm uh, available and the methodologies of that availability are going to change and uh, be beefed up. Our daily show will be different. And I know a lot of people want it to go for a couple hours. So I'm thinking about maybe setting it up in one hour segments. Uh, so that the files aren't too big, so you can use your uh, cell phone and uh, listen to it, part one, part two. Uh, and the, again, these will just be for members. And then I will probably uh, just have my uh, social media person posting any shows that we do to the public and uh, any of that stuff. And I just won't be on social media other than have somebody posting uh, stuff out there. So if we do something on YouTube or, or uh, Vimeo open to the public, that it'll go out that way through those social media things. I truly expect that Google will shut down the social media for me as well. So, but it's telling, isn't it telling, Ramjet, that they want to destroy a old bird an old senior flight attendant that figured out who did 9 11 why they did it who the real hijackers are what happened to the bodies and who are those people they called heroes what did they really do and you're going to know it and you know what for me as an airline professional this was the hardest thing i've ever uncovered because I had cognitive dissonance, I did not want to know what I found out. But I just kept digging, and I just kept digging until I found so much stuff that just stacked up like cordwood that I couldn't deny it any longer. And then, boom. I mean, it's just like, I mean, I would never, ever have dreamed that the crew members were involved with the Central Intelligence Agency had I not spoken with family members that knew. I would never have believed that because I, I, I just never flew those kind of flights. I never went in and out of D.C. Oh, I did a couple times, but not as a regular. I didn't fly regularly on a domestic route. I flew mostly as a purser uh, internationally to Europe and Asia and other places. So I just wasn't personally in a position. And of course, if any of my friends or coworkers in the airline had been offered a job with the CIA to do something like this, they sure as hell would never have told anybody. Because that's part of the deal, is keeping it a secret. So it's been a very interesting ride. Let me just say that. Uh, it's been, it's, to me, it's done. And what I'm going to do next is I'm going to show you all in nonfiction format so you know that uh, the novels were based on truth. That's why Google wants to silence me. And God only knows who else, but that's okay. It's all out there now for you. It will continue to be out there even upon my death the books have been set up. There are a couple people, uh, two or three people in Hollywood that are reading the series, that are looking at uh, potential movies. And that also has been set up in the event that I'm no longer here, uh, that people will be carrying the torch. And if that's uh, uh, a possibility, then they will be uh, set in and step-ins for me to keep the storyline are the same as the book and to not flip it around to the government conspiracy. And what I do know is this, the real 9-11 conspiracy, it is the official story. It isn't anything else. There were lots of people out there to come out and look like goonie birds. I, I mean, people like Jim Fetzer, I, I mean, just total conspiracy goonie bird. And they're there for a reason. And that's called uh, poisoning the fruit. And they, that's why the airline people that can, have come forward through me and myself have been such a threat to the truthers because they don't know the truth. 
They don't read. I think they just bloviate BS in most cases. They don't have any documentation. They don't have the data. And they don't have the experience that the air traffic controllers, the pilots, the flight attendants, the pursers, the ground personnel, the military intelligence people, the DEA people, the FBI, uh, ex-FBI people, everybody that's come forward that's helped me put all of this together for you. They don't have that. Well, what they don't have is German Shepherd DNA like you do. (laughs) They have Chihuahua DNA. (laughs) Chihuahua mixed with poodle. Chapupu. Uh, yeah, well, I guess that maybe that's true. And, you know, uh, sometimes uh, sometimes that's kind of a curse, but um, it is what it is. And I, quite frankly, um, I have this, uh, this sense right now that it's all out there for you, even though this book hasn't. It's all, if they killed me tomorrow, let me just say this, you can't stop book four. So don't even try it. If I were killed tomorrow by a drone strike or anything else. Uh, book four is still going to come out because it's all been, it's all arranged. It's all set up. It can't be stopped. And so for me, I have this sense of completion and I'm looking forward to putting together the nonfiction. And I say that it, it may be one, two or three books. Uh, there's a lot of data and there's a lot of explanation to that data and so, uh, quite frankly, I think this, the novels are going to be a little bit more entertaining, as a movie would be. Um, but this is going to show you um, how I based everything on and, and um, what really should have happened, the things the flight attendant should have said during a hijacking, uh, the, the things that they said that were the red flags for me. And so I'm just working now on uh, putting all that together, the outline and the format, and we'll see where it goes. And I hope if you people that have been bitching about <laughs> the novels, I never read novels. If you are, uh, you better be buying this next book <laughs> because, you know, this is the one, uh, and this is it because I have all this information. I ha- that's how I based all the 9-11 part of the novels on. So you're going to get to see it. And, uh, but you saw what happened when I put it out there uh, with the, the, just the screenshot on the YouTube. They, <laughs> they nuked the YouTube channel. <laughs> boom, no warning, just boom, it's gone. Uh, no email, hey, if you don't get that thing out of there, we're going to take your channel down. They just took the channel down. It's kind of like right now they're claiming that my membership site is a phishing site. And again, in case you missed that, you want to go uh, use a different browser than Chrome. Use Edge or Firefox or something. And if you do use Chrome and you can't get away from Chrome for whatever reason, just go to details and click on go to site anyway. There is no phishing there. It's all, all of the financing is done through offsite through uh, PayPal. And you can pay using any debit or credit card through that. Just look at other than PayPal. If you don't have a PayPal account, you can still come in with any credit or debit card. You just have to look. And I, if I remember correctly, it's been a while since I looked at this. It's like blueprint or something that says uh, not to use PayPal, but to use a, a credit card or other methodologies or something. And so just look for that blue. I think it's blueprint uh, to where you want to sign in with a debit card or credit card. I don't steal your information. I don't, I don't even get to see it. So all I get to see is that you're in and you can come into the chat room the chat room is also run separately so uh, you can sign in or you can come in as an anonymous person it's fine with me Uh, I like to know who people are so you can email me you can contact me through the website as well and um, and I'm going to be there because you're going to have questions trust me on this one the step out of the matrix from the end of book four you're going to need jump seat therapy so I'm going to give it to you All right, well, that's enough for today. I'm going to a little bit heavy on time, but um, we hope that you will um, come and join us over at vimeo.com, and it's uh, slash Rebecca Roth, and there's links down in the description box. Hey, I think I'm about to win a mucca. (laughs) I want to see what a mucca is. Okay, we'll see you next week.